Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Aaron Viner. In our top story, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is now preparing for an official visit to Washington within a few weeks' time following an invitation from U.S. President Donald Trump. The offer came during the two leaders' first telephone conversation after Trump took office. America's new commander-in-chief stressed his unprecedented commitment to Israel's security and the importance of strengthening ties between the two strong allies. Regarding the peace process with the Palestinians, Trump voiced his support for the Israeli premier's view that only direct negotiations between the two parties can resolve the conflict. Trump added that his administration will work with Jerusalem to achieve that goal. Both men agreed to hold further consultations on a range of regional issues, such as the threats posed by Iran. Sources close to Netanyahu described the conversation as very warm. And in related news, Israeli President Ruvain Rivlin has issued a personal invitation for his American counterpart to visit Jerusalem, although there's no word yet on when that trip might take place. President Trump told the Israel Today newspaper that he has not forgotten statements that he made on the campaign trail and that he intends to follow through on his pledge to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. He also stressed that it's well known that he's not a person who breaks his promises. Several of Trump's top advisors say that the president stands behind his words, unlike his predecessor Bill Clinton. While running for office during the 1992 presidential election, the Democratic leader repeatedly vowed to move the embassy, but soon abandoned that pledge after taking the White House. Both houses of Congress responded by passing the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995 with overwhelming majorities. Since that time, however, the law has been waived by three consecutive presidents a total of 35 times. Trump's White House spokesman Sean Spicer says that the administration is now in the early stages of talks about the relocation, which will likely be a core topic under discussion during the upcoming Netanyahu summit in Washington. The Muslim world has come out sharply against any such embassy move, which has been a lightning rod for protest and widespread Palestinian demonstrations against President Trump. Palestinian Authority leader Mahmoud Abbas and his Fatah party are threatening to withdraw whatever limited recognition they've made of Israel, and one Arab spokesman warned that the relocation would open the gates of hell in the region and in the world. Members of the Fatah Central Committee participated in an anti-Trump rally in Ramallah and openly declared that Jerusalem belongs to their future Palestinian state. Other speakers made similar claims in events in Hebron. Protesters in Bethlehem stomped on pictures of the American president before setting them on fire. Arab media published ominous caricatures of masked men marking the countdown to the end of Trump's term in office, while others portrayed the U.S. leader as waging war under the guise of peace. The Israeli army is warning of another spike in Arab terror attacks, which government officials blame on Palestinian leaders. Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman is accusing imams at mosques of using their sermons to incite violence in recent weeks on the direct orders of Palestinian President Abbas. During one incident recently in Nablus, hundreds of armed Damascus Palestinians shouted, Allah is great, and fired weapons into the air after the funeral of a terrorist who was shot dead while trying to stab Israeli soldiers. American Rabbi Marvin Heyer has become the target of online anti-Semitic attacks after he delivered the benediction at the inauguration of U.S. President Trump. Heyer is the dean and founder of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, which is dedicated to fighting Jewish persecution. A tidal wave of messages by white supremacists and users with Arabic names flooded social media with hate speech and the posting of anti-Semitic caricatures during and following Heyer's recitation. One vicious tweet demanded to know why a Jew rabbi was invited to the ceremony. And another poster, whose Twitter account is littered with multiple Nazi attributes, accused Heyer of being a goblin casting Jew spells. Heyer was the first Orthodox rabbi in history to deliver the benediction at an American president swearing in. The rabbi said he was honored to give the blessing, which he opened with a prayer asking the eternal God to bless President Donald J. Trump and the great nation of America. Meanwhile, four Orthodox Jews in London, including a mother and her 13-year-old son, were hit by gas canisters thrown by at least one assailant screaming, Heil Hitler, from a moving car. A 19-year-old suspect, who has been detained by police, confessed to perpetrating the attack. He also reportedly shouted, Hitler is on his way to you, at the victims. 
The assailant has been indicted on racially aggravated harassment and will be sentenced next month. Charges were dropped against two other men in their 20s who were with the suspect in his vehicle at the time of the assault. And in related news, the Oxford University Student Union has issued a statement condemning rising acts of anti-Semitism against Jewish students on campus. A special Jewish humanitarian operation called Blossom of Hope has delivered 1.5 tons of urgently needed relief supplies to Syrian refugees stranded on the Greek island of Lesbos. An Israeli aid organization issued an appeal for winter clothing for the homeless migrants who were enduring sub-zero temperatures amid a January snowstorm. In an overwhelming display of compassion, the Israeli people exceeded the donation's goal within just five days. And in a related story, the group Kitchen Without Borders is working to raise money and awareness of the plight suffered by Syrian refugees. The concept was cooked up by Tel Aviv restaurateur Yair Yosefi and food journalist Ronit Verid. The pair asked venues across Israel to create special dishes, especially inspired by Syrian cuisine. Participating restaurants sold delicious creations ranging from grilled lamb and cheese borekas to chickpea pate. All of the proceeds are being donated to the U.S.-based Karam Foundation that helps young Syrian migrants. Studies show that mistakes on prescriptions are responsible for the premature deaths of more than 220,000 Americans every year and cause harm to another million and a half people. That's because during that same time period, it's been shown that physicians make potentially life-threatening errors on about 8 million out of the 4 billion prescriptions that they fill out. Now an Israeli startup has just designed new software that's capable of almost entirely eliminating that problem. According to a new study by the Harvard Medical School, Israel's MedAware technology company integrated algorithms with machine learning in software that's capable of sending alerts when such mistakes are made. Harvard says that the Israeli programming sets a new standard for patient safety capable of saving literally millions of lives across the world. Israel's upgraded ballistic missile shield has entered a new era by launching a Star Wars-like extension. The Defense Ministry is reporting that the Israeli Air Force just activated the U.S.-funded Arrow 3 system that was jointly developed by state-owned Israel Aerospace Industries, the U.S. Missile Defense Agency, and Boeing. The Arrow 3 missiles soar into outer space where their warheads detach into kamikaze satellites or kill vehicles to track and then destroy their targets by slamming into them. Israel has frequently voiced concerns over the ballistic missile threat posed by Iran. The high-altitude Arrow 3 shootdowns are meant to safely destroy incoming nuclear, biological, or chemical missiles before they enter the atmosphere. It will serve as the top tier of an integrated Israeli shield that includes the Iron Dome and David's Sling rocket interceptors to combat any aerial threats against the Jewish state. Israel, the light unto the nations, today faces attack from more than just rockets and terrorism. Calls to boycott, sanction, and divest from Israel, known as BDS, are a form of economic warfare that you can help to prevent. The Israel Allies Foundation has launched a public service campaign called Defeat BDS, offering educational tools and other resources that you can use to stand with Israel and help make a difference. Just visit the easy-to-use website at www.defeatbds.org. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in a beautiful, windy day in our rooftop studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Rebecca Verbatim. She is the Zealous 8-2 coordinator for Bridges for Peace. Rebecca, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Uh, tell our viewers a little about what is Bridges for Peace. Okay. Well, Bridges for Peace has been in the land now for 51 years, and we're a Christian organization. Um, we have offices in eight different nations, and we are connecting Christians to Israel and to the Jewish people. 
Uh, we do that in a number of different ways. One of them is education to the church. And so in those eight different nations, we are educating Christians about what the Bible says concerning Israel and the Jewish people. And the other arm of our organization is outreach here, um, welcoming new Olim, giving out food to needy Israelis. We do home repair for those who need electrical or painting or plumbing done. Just a number of different things to really help repair the relationship between Christians and Jews. You're in charge of the Zealous 8-2 program. Can you tell us a little about that? Yes. So Zealous 8-2 comes from Zechariah 8-2, where God says, I am zealous for Zion with great zeal. And what we're doing through this program is we are connecting currently the millennial generation to what God is doing here in Israel and specifically through Bridges for Peace. So in those eight different nations, we are building young adult teams, working predominantly with ages 18 to 30. Um, and then we have a new program that started last year called the Zealous Israel Project. So every year we are taking 10 young adults from around the world. They're coming to Jerusalem to serve the different projects of Bridges for Peace. In addition to receiving education, um, our goal with that is that they will return home to their nation's uh, bold, educated voice for Israel. You know, one of the things that we're seeing is that the age of people who are actually going to church is going up and the youth isn't getting involved in church activities. Is Israel a good way to get the youth back engaged with the issues uh, of the Bible and you know, showing the fact that the mm -hmm. prophecies have been fulfilled in the land of Israel? I think Israel is an exciting way to connect the youth because what we're finding in this generation is so many of the young people are wanting absolute facts. They're wanting to really seek out the truth for themselves. And when they do this with the Bible and with Scripture, you can't help but run into Israel. You can't help but read through the, the Scriptures, the books of the prophets again, and see a connection to what's happening today. So I think it's a very exciting way for Christian young adults to connect back to the church, but also to Israel and to the Jewish people. There are some that complain that the youth today are not actually reading their Bibles. You know, they're going to church maybe and maybe they're praying, but mm -hmm. they don't know the Bible like the past generation. Mm -hmm. What is the program doing to get people back in touch with the Bible to understand what is actually written in the Bible? Okay, a, a number of different things. Um, first of all, let me talk about in the nations. Okay, so in the nations, as I said, we're, we're building young adult teams. So the Bridges for Peace leadership in the nations are teaching the young adults there. They're looking at scripture together. They're pointing out what God said concerning Israel, concerning the Jewish people, looking at what is happening today, um, and really training them in, in Bible literacy. What we're doing here with our group of 10, in addition to, to training them in Bible literacy and all of the teaching, is we're also memorizing scripture. One of the things that we want to equip them with is to be able to defend Israel from a biblical context. And so if they can return home to their churches, to their youth groups, to their Bible colleges, and be able to point out where God speaks specifically about Israel, which is, of course, throughout the entire Bible, then they're able to have a solid foot to stand on in, in their conversation and um, hopefully introducing their peers. And so scripture memory is, is a big part of what we're doing with them. Rebecca, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? Um, I'd like to say that in training young adults to understand the Bible in its entirety, it begins in the home. And so I think I, I'd like to speak to parents and say, read the Bible with your children. Let's talk about the Bible with your children. One of the things that I love about the Jewish people is the discussion of Torah on Shabbat. And so I want to encourage Christian families to read the Bible together. That way your children will grow up to be young adults who have a firm foundation in what the scriptures say regarding the world and the culture and it's so important that they understand Israel and the role of the Jewish people. Thank you Rebecca for being on the show and thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host Josh Reinstein, now back to the studio.
Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Ayesod. I'm Eliezer Moody Sandberg, World Chairman of Karen Ayesod, United Israel Appeal, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Today, you will witness the fulfillment of biblical prophecy through the gathering of the exiles. God bless you from Jerusalem. קשורה לישראל, שלא משנה איזה, איזה תחרות נוסעת קטנה, גדולה, כל פעם שאני רואה דגל ישראל זה עושה לי צמרמורת בגוף. אולימפיאדה זה חלום של כל ספורטאי, אני חושבת. איך שנכנסנו לאולימפיאדה, לכפר אולימפי, ראינו הספורטאים הכי טובים שיש באמת, כאילו, מכל עולם, וואו, גם אנחנו ביניהם. אין לי מדינה אחרת, זה הבית שלי. העלייה לישראל היא עוזרת להגשים לי את החלומות שלי, היא עוזרת לממש את השאיפות שלי ואת הפוטנציאל שלי כאומן. למרות שהמשפחה שלי היא משפחה יהודית, עד גיל 14 בערך לא היה לי שם איזשהו מושג מה זה להיות יהודי, חוץ מזה שזה לא הנושא שכדאי לדבר עליו בקרב החברים ובבית ספר ובמקומות ציבוריים בכלל. לא פחדתי לעלות, לא פחדתי לעלות כי ידעתי שאני לא אהיה לבד. לא פחדתי לעלות כי ידעתי שלמרות שאני עוזב את הבית והמשפחה שלי לא תהיה איתי, אבל יהיה מאחוריי גב. establish and live a life in Israel. I still see myself as an Oleh Hadash or new immigrant. My current role at Bank Lomi, which allows me to act as an ambassador both for the bank and for the State of Israel, makes me feel like I come full circle. We have a people who for the past 60 years, despite challenges, despite hardships, despite a war every decade, continue to succeed on an international scale. This is the land of modern-day heroes. I came from Transylvania. In Romania, I was 14. Here I saw the first time a connection between our hearts, the Torah of Israel, the Torah of Israel, and Israel. Every one of you here can come here. כי נותנים לו את ההזדמנות, הרבה בזכות קרן היסוד והתרומות ש... שאנשים טובים נותנים, להתחנך, לגדול ולהיות יום אחד מן הימים רופא, פרופסור באוניברסיטה, רב, מדען או אלוף בצה"ל. בלעדיכם התורמים היה קשה למדינת ישראל להתמודד עם האתגר הזה ולהבטיח שאנחנו לאורך זמן נממש את החלום שלנו להקים מדינה בטוחה ובית לעם היהודי. The Aliyah is the new blood that have to be constantly injected to, to make us better people. And in order to make us better people, we need Aliyah. The majority of Israelis in one way or the other are either Olim themselves or descendants of Olim. And uh, this is the power of the state. It's, uh, it's a major force. Come join Karen Ayesod in fulfilling biblical prophecy. Let's bless Israel together.
To donate and get information, call us at 1-800-505-1665 or visit our website at www.khisrael.org. to speak soon with President Trump about how to counter the threat of the Iranian regime which calls for Israel's destruction. But it struck me recently that I've spoken a lot about the Iranian regime and not enough about the Iranian people, or for that matter, to the Iranian people. So I hope this message reaches every Iranian, young and old, religious and secular, man and woman. I know you'd prefer to live without fear. I know you'd want to be able to speak freely, to love who you want without the fear of being tortured or hung from a crane. I know you'd like to surf the web freely and not have to see videos like this one using a virtual private network to circumvent censorship. You have a proud history. You have a rich culture. Tragically, you're shackled by a theocratic tyranny. In a free Iran, you will once again be able to flourish without limit. But today, a cruel regime is trying to keep you down. I'll never forget the images of brave young students hungry for change, gunned down in the streets of Tehran in 2009. And I'll never forget beautiful Neda Sultan, gasping for her last breath on that sidewalk. This ruthless regime continues to deny you your freedom. It prevents thousands of candidates from competing in elections. It steals money from your poor to fund a mass murderer like Assad. By calling daily for Israel's destruction, the regime hopes to instill hostility between us. This is wrong. We're your friend, not your enemy. We've always distinguished between the Iranian people and the Iranian regime. The regime is cruel. The people are not. The regime is aggressive. The people are warm. I yearn for the day when Israelis and Iranians can once again visit each other freely in Tehran, in Isfahan, in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv. The fanatics must not win. Their cruelty must not conquer our compassion. Our two peoples can work together for a more peaceful and hopeful future for both of us. We must defeat terror and tyranny, and we must ensure that freedom and friendship win the day. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. So I survived the Nazi murder machine and I feel that I'm a living miracle that I'm standing here and talking to you. אנחנו כיהודים עברנו את השואה בצורה קשה וניצולי שואה מהבית החם שכולם חוו את השואה במצב קשה מגיעים לבית הנשיא זה בשבילהם מין כזה סגירת מעגל שלפני 70 שנה לא היה לנו מדינה ולא היה מי שישמור עלינו והיום יש להם את מי שישמור עליהם ויש מדינה כבוד הנשיא נכנס יקיריי, לכל אחת ואחת מכן סיפור משלו, סיפור טבח, טבח בני משפחה וקהילה, 
סיפור פליטות ופחד, סיפור הצלה ותקומה. אך יותר מהסיפור האישי האינדיבידואלי, זהו סיפור של דור שלם. דור שנחלץ מתאומות הרוע ובחר בחיים. דור של גבורה ועשייה, דור שתרם לחברה הישראלית בכל תחומי החיים. ההיאחזות, ההיאחזות שלכם בחיים, חרף המסע, מסע הזיכרון הכואב, היא המסר שאותה, שאותו אתם נושאים מאז ועד היום. אני מאחל לכם שנים ארוכות, שמחות ובריאות, שבהם נזכה להגיד פעם אחר פעם את המילים האלו, שהחיינו וקיימנו והגיענו לזמן הזה. היו ברוכים, אנשים יקרים. היו ברוכים. תודה רבה. אני רוצה שכל היהודים מכל העולם יבואו אלינו פה. פה זה המדינה שלנו, אין לנו לאן ללכת. שלעולם, לעולם לא יהיה דבר כזה. הדור הצעיר צריך לשמור שלא ייווצרו מקומות של שואה, לא אצל היהודים, בפרט בעולם. Hey, אני חושב שזה הדבר הטוב שאלוהים עשה ב... בינינו, החיבור, זה, אני חושב שיש פה יד אלוהים. אין לי ספק שללא השגרירות הנוצרית לא יכלנו להקים את הבית החם לניצולי שואה ואני חושב שאתם חלק אינטגרלי בסיוע הכספי, באהבה, במתנדבים אני חושב שאין דבר יותר טוב ממה שאתם עושים לניצולי שואה וכולכם יודעים שניצולי שואה אנחנו יוצאים בחמש או העשר שנים האחרונות שאפשר לעזור לאותו ניצולי שואה That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El-Rom. And I'm Erin Viner, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.